like to introduce Basu Galamadi. So firstly, I want to thank Wayne for not really yet writing the obituary for all the banking community. So the, thank you for that. We are not yet, uh, I'm, I'm glad you want to partner with us and not really uh, kill us and, and, and have a tombstone ready. Um, so that was, that was a promising start to this, to this session of mine, where we're really talking about a, an arcane topic. And most of you heard of risk. We all heard about how there are many areas that are boring and healthcare and so on. And we, we hear amongst tech entrepreneurs talking about exciting new technology. So this is potentially a very, very boring topic. So I'll try my best to keep it entertaining. Um, and we'll see where we get. So th the specific application of technology within risk management is really what I um, wanted to talk about today to you. So I want to begin with a confession. And the confession goes like this. So my understanding of technology is on a, on a scale of 0 to 100, pro possibly tending to the 0. So I will not claim any knowledge of technology. What I'm going to do is give you a user's perspective. And we in banking um, use a lot of technology. Uh, and I've dealt with companies of all sizes and shapes and coming to us and pitching to us. So hopefully through this session, I'll give you some insight into the kinds of technology that's used in risk management. Uh, what are the trends uh, going forward? Uh, especially for those of you who are trying to develop technologies for the banking industry. I originally had a quote from Mark Zuckerberg, and I thought maybe that's not a very good idea right now. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll settle for T.S. Eliot, and he says it very eloquently about um, you know, risk being part virtually of every single aspect of our life, and forget about having um, risk as part of the financial industry. Uh, as may, many of you know, and I think for this particular group of people who, who thrive on risk, I don't need to uh, stress on the fact that risk and reward are two sides of the coin. And while they, if there is no risk, there's no reward. So while we, that is universally understood, I think there is virtually no industry out there where risks play out in all its glory like they do in, in the financial industry. Um, so there is a whole diversity of different risks. So we, we, have the we have market risk, we have credit risk, we have operational risks of many sorts, and all of these risks play out in the financial industry in one form or the other. The, the, there are different levels of maturity for these risks, so credit and market risk, for instance, are highly more evolved just because of the sheer history on them. But there are new risks under the operational bucket which is cyber risk, for example, which is evolving. And many of you are very, very familiar with that. <clears throat> so banks have to navigate through this complex maze of risks and manage them and, and, and control them so that we can keep making money. And I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll very shortly cover how going is getting really tough for banks. So there are, before we dive into what kind of technology is used in, in risk management, I thought I would cover some risk 101. Uh, so bear with me for those who are very familiar with it. So the three phases of it, the, the, so it starts with forecasting, so how much of inherent risk of each type there is. So there are, there's, a, there's a whole forecasting aspect to risk. Then there is a mitigation, so knowing what the risk is and the, and, the, and the size of the risk is not enough. We need to find the best, most optimum way to mitigate that risk. So there are technology tools that we use to, for mitigation as well. And finally, all of that needs tracking. So we have, we have tracking tools to understand how the forecasting is working and how the mitigation, therefore, is working as well. On forecasting, it tends to be very data intensive. So we have data warehouses, uh, data exploration, statistical tools. So we have very, very big users of data warehousing technologies like Teradata, uh, Oracle. So we tend to be the biggest customers for, for large data companies. We also are very large customers for data ETL tools. Uh, we have um, Ab Initio um, and, and, and many of the da data transformation tools that are out there. Statistical modeling is at the core of what happens with, data, with, with risk forecasting. So we are big customers of SAS um, and many other tools, including our studio and so on. And then finally, 
around decision trees. So we have CART, we have um, Shade, and so on. So there are many data segmentation tools that are out there, and we tend to be large customers of that. In, in, in terms of mitigation, the, the whole idea of mitigation in a large company like City is spread across multiple countries. The whole idea of mitigation is to get consistency with the rollout of mitigation so that we can have coherence to the whole risk management framework. And the idea of, of, of this is the automation across the enterprise in a consistent manner. There are various B2B solutions, B2C solutions that quite often include the customer interaction in risk management. Uh, we think of risk management typically as an in, internal to the organization, but quite often cu customers contribute to the overall evaluation of risk. Uh, various decision engines that we use, workflow tools and process automation. Um, and the final one, which is tracking, and they, it, it's getting uh, uh, more and more sophisticated with the dashboards getting more customized, more targeted, um, alerts which are more mobile, uh, where we, uh, many of the alerts are actually down to, to the employee level and then mobile applications that are intranet built on the company's intranet. The changes in the financial industry, um, and which is why there is a greater, greater, greater focus on risk management, are, are three-pronged. One is the regulatory changes that we are seeing and that they continue to, continue to build, um, uh, uh, build on. There's non-traditional competition to banks. Uh, there are, we've talked about many of, the, many of the innovations in the payment space and we've looked at earlier, and the morphing customer behavior. So the three-prong changes to the competition. So it's no longer the traditional banks that are contributing to the competition. So the first one is a heightened regulatory focus. If you could see from 1960 onwards, and this is in constant uh, $2,000, um, we have $190 million of regulatory spend on regula uh, uh, in 1960. That's all the way up to 2.3 million uh, by the time we got to 2010. So there has been a, an escalation of spend on, on regulations. There are some key points along the way. The Dodd-Frank Act, which I know is in, is in discussions right now for repeal, but the, there is the, the intensity of the regulation and the, and the intensity of the regulatory change has been enormous. Competition, as I talked about, is, is gone beyond just the traditional banks. We have challenger banks. We have technology companies. We have retailers that are coming into the space. Many of these competitors are largely in the payment space, but we are seeing notable exceptions, including Amazon, which is now getting into checking accounts. Um, and, they're, and they're taking over large slices of, of the market that banks have. Many of those at this point are pure partnerships with banks, but there would be a time very soon, and we are not naive enough to think that there would be a time when the competition will start to eat into our revenue pies. The customer behavior at the same point has been morphing quite fundamentally. So the savings rate in the US had peaked right after the financial crisis, although they're now dropping, they're still hist at the historical highs. The revolving balances on credit cards, which is one of the key sources of banking revenue, has been flat from 2000 and 2010 onwards. So you can see that it's been, we had, we have been virtually flat at 800 billion, eight, around $800 billion, which happens to be, by the way, the, the revenue with the largest margins for, from a banking perspective. The compounded annual growth rate in the assets dropped from 14.8% to 1.8% over this period. We, the rate of return dropped from 1.8% to 0.6%. And as, as an outcome of all of this, a market performance of banks was only a 32% um, in the index growth over a 10 year period versus the overall market which grew at 250%. So it's, pretty gloomy from a financials perspective. Many banks actually are now trading well below their book value. It's not a great time to be in banking industry. However, we, we, see, some, you know, we see some bright light there, which is how do we get and rethink this and use this as an opportunity to leapfrog 
and get into the tech space where we can serve our customers. And banks, by the way, have the largest customer base of any, of, of any institution you can think of. And we know the kind of detail about a customer that very few institutions out there do, uh, which is we know about the financial performance of these customers and the financial behavior. So the two ways in which banks are still trying to be relevant is since the top line growth has been difficult, is to look at how we can contain expenses. And the second area is how do we get more precise with our risk forecasting, which will improve our credit costs and therefore maintain our margins. So if you were to look at this in a two-dimensional space, our involvement with technology, and technology is, is the biggest lever that we have in making this transition possible, we've got, if you look at the two-dimensional space of task complexity and value, there are possibly three phases in which banks are using the new age technology. One is robotic process automation, and there, that's possibly the largest slice of our investment so far in getting technologies to help us with automating what typically is done by human beings. And just by the sheer nature of this technology, that tends to be less in, less in terms of complexity of the task and therefore limited in terms of the opportunity that it, it addresses. We then have machine learning in terms of using uh, software to, uh, to identify and optimize for situations that cannot be completely and totally programmed up front, and so how we can learn as we go along. And that machine learning is certainly a, the biggest opportunity that we see, given the low ROIs with anything to do with RPA. So we are transitioning increasingly towards machine learning. The, with, the, the area that is most exciting and possibly the one with the largest, uh, largest pie out there for, for, as an opportunity is cognitive intelligence, where we are combining not just the, the ability to look at um, unforeseen circumstances, but actually use that as learning opportunities for using automation. So where we have a lot of these initiatives are in the lab, very few of these have been implemented and they're likely to get rolled out over the next few years. And we're very excited about the rollout of many of these technologies we have, uh, where, we, where we have tied up with many companies. So there, I wanna leave you with, yes, a few key trends that we see in risk management. That could be a good insight into companies that are trying to develop solutions for the financial industry, the especially in risk management. The first is the, the move away from this um, episodic risk assessment. So we're normally used to a mortgage company doing a risk assessment up front for a, for a customer, but how do we get to a more continuous risk assessment? How do we use data, both internal data and external data, to have a process where we are continuously evaluating the data and not do it episodically? So that's one key trend. The other is, we have many banks stuck with legacy systems, and they are transitioning away from those legacy systems by getting more modular. So companies which can develop modular technology, which can address specific use cases, would, uh, would, find, uh, would find huge opportunities. Decision automation, uh, while it is boring and has been around a long time, it continues to be an area of great opportunity where we can automate decisions, especially around the area of taking out costs, which continues to be a big uh, focus for banks. Data exploration and visualization. I talked about the, the enormous amount of data that exists within banks. Uh, in fact, at one point, banks also considered the fact on how to monetize the value of this data. A lot of it is done simply by cross-selling banking products to the same customers but there's an obvious limit to it. So how do we get more of the banking data unlocked in its value and, its, uh, and, and how do we make that available, not just to the banks, but, but more broadly uh, a, as a resource? And then finally, it's the increasing demand for translators. One of the issues that we have within large institutions, and I'm sure banks are not the only exceptions, is that the, the various silos in a large organization means that the translation between what the business truly wants to what 
gets trans and transmitted out to the technology partners is often uh, introduces a lot of noise. So we need translators both ways. We need translators within the tech companies that can truly understand a business need, and we need translators within within banks who can convert that business uh, opportunity to something more tangible and work with the technology companies. I see as, as we go forward, that'll be a huge opportunity uh, to increase, increase, the, um, increase the use of technology within banks. Technology has become such a large part of banking that you know, many CEOs of banks, including mine, they actually talk about our institutions really as technology companies with a banking license. Right? So if that is to be true, then we need technology companies to work more as a trusted partner rather than a service provider or someone who is selling a product to banks. And that's a key transition, I believe, that we need to make um, in, in our interactions with technology uh, and, and for all of you to look for opportunities on doing further business with, with, with banks. So that's about it, thank you. Okay, I already got tapped on the shoulder for my first question over here. Hi, Vasu. I, I had a question where this, just to avoid, I mean, the, 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 I saw one of the slides which said regulation is one of the uh, uh, aspects of managing the risk. Now, with the new government, which is rolling back the Dodd-Frank compliancy, there is a saying that in the 2008 debacle, it was this credit derivative swaps, which was the root cause of the debacle. But with the Dodd-Frank being reversed, do you see a risk in that? Uh, being, are, we, are we going to see another 2008 debacle? A follow-up question to that is, do you think the answer to that, to mitigate the risk for that, is blockchain is the answer for that? So let me hand, uh, try to handle the second part first, which is blockchain. And I'll be the first to admit I have no idea about blockchain and how it works. So I'll, I'll be candid in admitting that. The first part, which is, is regulation a, a, a friend or a foe? It was almost uh, you know, automatic. The, w the response 10 years ago would, be, would have been that regulation is, un is an unmitigated disaster for banks. And it normally causes the growth rates to fall, it, it imposes a cost on banks, and so on and so forth. In reality, though, we found in the past few years that regulation actually works as a brilliant entry barrier. For large banks especially, it, uh, regulation and the cost of regulation often causes um, or often results in new banks not being able to enter the market. So it uh, possibly is a good thing, and tongue-in-cheek is a good thing for banks and large banks that regulation exists and continues to thrive. Um, it, more seriously, I think the problem with reversing any of the regulation is that what happened 10 years ago can quite easily happen again. And I think it, it, it is really important as we peel back some of this regulation, we understand all of the implications on it. And Dodd-Frank is, I think, the, the, the thing that has ensured the, sus the sustenance of the, of the financial industry. So I would, I would ensure that um, I would ask for um, a, a lot of care before we start to repeal regulation. So th I think the first primary control is the adequate capital. So the, the, the capital requirement, which in prior to the financial crisis, we had um, an asset base of roughly 6% of our assets. It was the capital. Now it's on an average about 11 to 12%. So we have significantly built up our capital uh, and that's possibly a one good fallout of the the regulation that came right after the crisis is the capital requirements have gone up significantly. So I think that's the first line of defense really for banks. The other is that we have significantly simplified institutions, especially large institutions like Citi, that we used to be 
uh, almost like a supermarket of financial services. And we wanted to be everything for everybody. And I think post the crisis, what has been forced on us, and which in hindsight was a good thing, is to simplify the organization. So we have very clear bank banking verticals that run across the whole organization around the world. And we are not into um, you know, selling designer products, which clearly have the marginal risk on them is, is, is too high for us to sustain. So I think the simplification, increased capital adequacy, combined as, as is, has been, have been really the, the modes of defense. So let's hear Professor. Yeah.